wider geopolitical impact. Let's bring in Jamie Metzl. He's a senior fellow of the Atlantic Council. He has also worked for the U.S. State Department and National Security Council and has visited a North Korea himself. Jamie, great to see you. Uh, first of all, I'm, I want to talk about China in a second. First off, do you believe that North Korea does now indeed have the capability to launch these smaller nuclear warheads? In the past, there has been uh, some skepticism surrounding their claims. Where do we think they stand right now? Yeah, it's very difficult to assess exactly where they are, but clearly they are making significant progress in that direction. Their, their missile launches have been more successful. Their nuclear detonations have been more successful. They've been launched, they had a first launch uh, from a uh, submarine. Whether they have miniaturized enough so they could put and create an effective, uh, deliverable, medium-range or not, definitely not long-range nuclear weapon, that still seems unlikely. But what is clear is that this is not a political process. This is a military process where they're doing as many tests as is necessary to continuously improve the quality of their nuclear weaponization and delivery, and they're making big progress. I, I want to pick up on something Paula was just talking about and that the relations have never been worse between China and North Korea. Um, let's play that forward. Does that mean that there is an opportunity for China and the U.S. to work more closely here? Or is there so much tension around that relationship that it's going to be difficult to make any progress? Well, we need to unpack what's happening between China and North Korea. Clearly, the relationship between those two countries probably has never been worse. But still, China is providing an essential lifeline of trade and aid, including food and energy resources, that's keeping North Korea alive. So China is willing to put pressure on North Korea, but not so much pressure as would make a difference. And North Korea is basically calling China's bluff, saying, look, now, we know that you care more about your relationship with the United States than you care about really anything that we do. And so we're going to continue to do, North Korea is going to continue to do what its leaders feel that it, it's in its own interest. And so China right now is in a very difficult position. Uh, it, China has all the cards it needs to significantly influence North Korea's behavior, but it's not willing to do it because the fear of a reunified uh, Korea potentially allied uh, or likely allied with the United States is greater to China than the fear of a nuclear weaponized North Korea, even one with a hostile relationship with China. Mm. Jamie, what do you make of the timing of this by North yeah, it's, Korea? It's very, very uh, significant. First, during uh, the Hangzhou G, uh, G20, North Co uh, Korea uh, launches three missiles, which is clearly a snub uh, to, uh, to China. Uh, now, just at the end, of those meetings uh, at the same time as the, uh, the continued announcement of progress on THAAD, the nuclear uh, missile shield, I'm sorry, the missile shield uh, that's being built, it will be built in, uh, in South Korea. Um, so I think uh, North Korea is making a political statement that it's not beholden to anybody, including to China. And as I said a moment ago, it's calling, uh, you know, calling China's bluff. Uh, it's, it comes on the last day of President Obama's uh, trip to Asia and on the 68th anniversary of the founding of North Korea. So this is not a North Korean regime, is not a government that's saying we're in decline or we're going anywhere. They're saying, hey, we're here, we're here to stay, and you better take us seriously. That's right, and it also happening, as in this country, we were having a robust discussions about national security for the, right. the two candidates who are vying to become the next U.S. president. Are they overestimating uh, their hand when it comes to China, Jamie? I understand what you're saying about a reunified mm -hmm. South Korea being something that is of great concern to China, but I would imagine that they do not appreciate um, this sort of action and, and being uh, treated in this way by North Korea either. You know, what do you, where do you think they'll settle? If they're not going to cut off that lifeline, what can they do to send a strong message to North Korea? Well, they've done a lot of the things, uh, China has done a lot of the things it can do to deliver a message. It's supported sanctions in the United Nations. It's made some relatively strong statements of, uh, of condemnation. Um, but there is a debate inside of China, within China's national security establishment. I've, speak, I've spoken with people in, uh, in China on both sides of this. And basically, there are some people who say North Korea is our ally. Whatever happens in North Korea, China is better off with North Korea there than with a reunified Korea. And there are others, uh, particularly in the foreign ministry, but also elsewhere, 
uh, who are saying that, look, China would be an enormous beneficiary of a reunified Korea because trade links with China would be enormous. It would lead uh, to de the development of Northeast China. And this threat of nuclear weapons from North Korea, it threatens China perhaps more uh, than South Korea, Japan, or the United States, because what's the likelihood of an accident? Pretty high. And China is right there. Uh, the North Korea is a very irrational uh, regime, and its relations with China are terrible. There's a land dispute with China. There's a lot of tension there. So China, I think, ultimately, and when ultimately happens, we don't know, I, I believe, will yeah. have to recognize that it's a greater beneficiary of a reunified Korea than this terrible situation in North Korea today. Certainly the stakes are very high. Jamie Metzl, always appreciate your insight, Jamie. Thank you so much. My